Good afternoon and welcome to Virtual Wednesdays. My name is Devin Malone and I'm the Director of Public Programs and Community Engagement at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. Today's talk, Persian Carpets and Women's Creative Work by Dr. Manu Moalem, is a very special one in that it marks the first day of Women's History Month and serves as the 13th annual Caroline and H. McCoy Jones Memorial Lecture at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. To share more about today's speaker, Dr. Manu Moalem is a professor of Gender and Women's Studies and the Director of Media Studies at UC Berkeley. She is the author of numerous publications, including Persian Carpets, The Nation as a Transnational Commodity, and Between Warrior Brother and Veiled Sister, Islamic Fundamentalism and the Cultural Politics of Patriarchy in Iran. She has also ventured into digital media and her online project, Nation on the Move, was published in Vectors, Journal of Culture and Technology in a Dynamic Vernacular. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Manu Moalim, and thank you so much for joining us. I would like to thank. I would like to start by thanking Devine for her kind introduction. And I am delighted to give a lecture named in honor of Caroline and McCoy Jones and their beautiful collection of textile from Central Asia. I also like to thank Laura Camelengo for her invitation and Rosario Sotelo, Rich Rice, Devine Malone, Maria Egoavil, Magnolia Molkan, and Antonio Smith for all their work on this event. Objects and commodities are crucial in our lives. They impact our perception of a good life, a sense of security and connectedness in a space. They influence our ideas of beauty, comfort, leisure, labor, identity. They also construct us as particular subjects to bring these commodities into our lives and relationships with them affectively. Weaving is practiced all over the world and textile are produced everywhere from quilting to clothing to textile to carpets to silk in various parts of the world. And both men and women are involved in that. While men are weavers also, there are factories and there are weaving that are being taking place in uh, large factories but masses of women perform weaving in informal spaces in their houses or in their semi-workshop settings. Persian carpet in particular has been exhibited, circulated, bought and sold and produced and consumed in Europe, the US, in very various parts of the world and in Iran, roughly from 1887 to the present as a commodity. Weaving and textile in general and carpets are among life-affirming forms of labor produced everywhere. However, oriental carpets like ships, trains, airplanes since colonial modernity have become a site of time travel between the past and the present, the religious and the secular, the private and the public, the tradition and modernity, the image and the material object, the real and the virtual. Persian carpets are distinguished from other carpets because of their high quality, defined by a number of by the number of knots or high knot density, made and tied by hand, which range from many knots, 400 to 50 per square inch, and have the capacity to draw circular designs. So the ways in which I structure this talk is that I'm going to tell the story of Persian carpets, carpet looms, and the arts of carpet weaving. Most of the time, this story is told apart from three historical experiences, the history of technology, the art history, and the history of women's creative labor. I will elaborate briefly on each of these experiences. Still, before I do that, I would like to give you a sense of 
what I've done in the past 15 years <laughs> through my two projects. One is a digital project, uh, which is called Nation on the Move, and uh, my slides are not okay, voila. Uh, Nation on the Move, and this is a digital project that is supported by uh, University of Southern California. It's online and you can access this. So in the digital projects, I actually, when I started to research Persian carpets, because Persian carpets is a, a commodity which is very close to me, I was raised with carpets. And when I became diasporic, it didn't take long before my house was crowded with Persian carpets that each family member, each relatives, when they traveled from Iran, they brought me one. So it's an object which is very close to my life and my thinking and my scholarship. So anyhow, 15 years ago, I started to work on that. And the first project was this digital project. In the digital project, Nation on the Move, that, that I collaborated with the artist and designer, Eric Lawyer, who designed the whole project. What you see here in the screen is um, you are basically the audience, the reader, is asked to weave a carpet and and you can't get to the meaning of the to the text of the this project without weaving without weaving this carpet and the panels on this uh, platform combine different times spaces locations ethnographic fictional virtual including photographs, TV auctions, films, orientalist paintings, advertisement, and art galleries. The challenge in each panel is to demonstrate how the shattering effects of consumerism are overcome through a scopic economy that binds culture and economy, subject and object, self and other, within the limits of an intelligible pathway. So the, the embodied interaction with the interface or the computer surpasses the centrality of sight that has been emphasized since modernity. It involves other senses, including hearing, touching, the aesthetic and affective pleasures of visual maps, moving diagrams, and geometric shapes. In this project, I asked what it means to consume carpets, how does the Persian carpet link and mediate the project of empire and nation, how does the Orientalist imagining of particular material objects produce value, regulate their labor, and channel desire for consumption? What do films, media, advertisement, connoisseur literature have to do with the consumption of Persian car carpets? So as for the project of the book that um, you see here, the book focuses on Persian carpets as modern commodities. Of course, I decided to focus on Persian carpet as a commodity and move to various spaces, wherever the object took me, wherever the Persian carpet took me, I followed it. So I went to various archives, to museums, to libraries, to villages, carpet producing villages, and uh, talked to carpet weavers and so on. So basically in this project, I prioritized an understanding of commodity. So I followed it around. So of course, carpets have been made in various parts of Iran for thousands of years, and under Safavid dynasty, they became luxury objects par excellence, and were offered as gifts in diplomatic and trade relations. However, since 19th century, Persian carpet industries have been dominated by mass production, consumerism, commodification, and labor exploitation. In this book, I wanted to tell the story of Persian carpets as a commodity transformed from a luxury object to a mass produced commodity. However, as I, as I argue in the book, we must study the history of colonialism in Iran to understand carpets as transnational commodity and networks of relationality 
from the center of the British Empire to the circulation of carpets to various parts of the world, to trade embargoes since the Iranian Revolution and the production, the export of the labor to other parts of the world. So through a transnational feminist lens in this book, I followed the carpet from museums to libraries to connoisseur books to factories to family household and to villages. The idea is that to tell the story of Persian carpets as commodities or the process of commodification, we need to understand the history of informal imperialism in Iran since the 18th and 19th centuries and the centrality of oil and carpet in the Iranian in the Iranian economy, because oil and carpet, as we see in this, you know, British colonial maps, were identified as two important components of Iran. And then, you know, I tell the story of carpets through trade relations and how several treaties between Iran and British or multinational companies protected the interests of the British Empire and its allies. So, as you know, until mid-20th century, there were so many multinational or British-owned companies that were producing carpet in Iran. Gradually, the carpet industry in Iran got rid of multinational corporations and it started to rely on the national elite. As you know, the oil became nationalized under Mossadegh nationalist government. However, the carpet industry slowly because the national elite took over the carpet industry and carpet industry stayed within the informal networks of production as well as formal networks of production. It also started to rise to become a national commodity identified with the diversity of Iran. The nationalist elite started to invest value in it and with the mass migration of Iranians in the West and the embargo and sanctions on, on carpet export for a while from the US, the carpet became an object of diasporic movement and important site of diasporic affective nationalism. So these are themes that I discuss in the book extensively. So I also show that Persian carpets were part of a series of goods that I call Orientalia. And Orientalia, as I defined it here, is commodities that emerged in the late 19th and early 20th century due to the encounter between the colonial West and many directly or indirectly colonized countries. And Orientalia, in my view, is both material objects and moving images. As you see, there are so many images that are using Orientalia. And I argue that while the seminal work of Edward Said on Orientalism has generated a world of scholarship, including a significant body of literature on various forms of Orientalism and the implication of gender and sexuality in the Orientalist discourse, very little attention has been paid to the objects and commodities in the Orientalist discourse. So the argument is that the consumption of things Oriental made the Orient tangible, tactile, and collectible. So I use the notion of civilizational objects to talk about those objects or those commodities that started to circulate, invested, they were invested with images of difference, maintaining and establishing a boundary between the West and the East, the Orient and the Occident, the primitive and modern, and the religious and secular, the folklore and the art. So now let me know that I gave you uh, uh, an, uh, an idea of what the book and the digital project are about. Let me focus on my first inquiry on the linkages on the history of technology and the ways in which carpets are linked with that. The genealogy of the invention of the computer has been traced to great men of the Industrial Revolution, including Joseph Mario Jacquard, a silk weaver who created an enhanced textile 
an enhanced textile. Let me go back here. An enhanced textile um, um, silk weaver and who created an enhanced textile loom in 1801, the Jacquard loom was the first machine to use punch cards to control the weaving of every single row of a pattern fabric as it operated 25 times faster than the draw loom that existed before. More computer language, most computer language is borrowed from carpet weaving. Texture, pattern, layering, links, knots, sampling, net, networks, narrative, web, web beaver, and etc. The linkage between these histories have been lost to the masculinist history of technology. As noted by Gabrielle and Wagmister, weaving is digital in that it relies on digits, on fingers for production. Digits understood in this way tend to emphasize the sensory and more particularly the tactile aspect of technology and culture per se. Thus the digital involves a palpable re relationality between a wide array of cultural meanings woven by the community as a whole and handed from one generation to the next, end of the quote. The extraction of a speed in managing productivity went together with the development of masculinist and militarist scientific invention. The separation of the loom from the weavers, I argue, subordinated the rich culture of collaborative, artistic, and technical knowledge of rural tribal women carpet weavers to male technological inventions, expelling female weavers to the realm of the natural, the troubled, the primitive. So it would be tough to talk about carpets and computers in the same frame of reference without interrogating two interconnected problems. First is what I discussed thus far, regarding the construction of oriental carpets as belonging to the world of nature, oriental magic, tradition, and that you see it a lot in, in uh, those, those objects, this orientalia, or the objects that have been invested with mysterious power, like a flying carpet and, and many other objects in Hollywood, early Hollywood Orientalist movies, in Disney movies, and, and it still continue to be there. Secondly, during the formation of Iran as a modern state, nation state, the local elite invested in the Persian carpets as authentic objects belonging to the timeless essence of the nation. Suppressing the genealogy or a story of carpets as modern commodities, along with layers of mediation and control in the production, circulation, and consumption of the carpets. The carpet weaving and carpet looms are still represented as pre-modern belonging, belonging to another temporality, which is the temporality of the primitive, while carpet weaving has significantly influenced modern imagination and innovation, from airplanes to computers, and actually for a great analysis of Islamic aesthetics and new media art, you should consider looking at Laura Mark's fabulous book that explains very in very detail the contribution of Islamic aesthetics to new media art. Technological objects and let me move forward, and artifacts inform us about how culture and technology converge and influence each other. And the nature of continuity and technological change as influenced by various exchanges between different cultures and societies. Both the carpet and the computer mediate in creating a world of connections, linking different operating systems while facilitating the regulation and control of information. The question is how best subjects or agents can interact with the information, the pattern, the design to challenge, revise, transform, or alter it. 
The carpet at the loom is a site of both visualization and virtuality as it becomes a garden, a geometrical abstraction of shapes and symbols, a field of flowers and animals and colors and shape, or the views of a paradise and imaginary varietals. The weaver's digital juxtaposition of the artistic, the technical and the mathematical creates webs of connections between the past and the present, the technical and the artistic, the collective and the individual, to bring the corporeal together with what we live for an extended period of time. To recognize the connection between carpets and computers, we should change our reliance on the definition of the machine and the commodity as separated from the knowledge and network that provide the capacity for the new invention, for the new invention or innovation of the tools. Computers emphasize flow over form. The carpet does the same thing. Also, computers use notions of interconnectedness and networking. Carpet does the same. The consequence is not only the history of carpet and computers getting disconnected from each other, but also the hegemonic power of masculine sciences, both in its imperial and national variation, enable subordination of women's modes of knowing or savoir-faire and perpetuating feminization of exploitative labor in the oriental carpet industry. I like to argue that carpets actually are complex objects. They function as a virtual space. They're mnemonic devices. For example, if we consider carpets as an interface, they become a site of philosophical reflections, such as this one. So that this is a carpet made by Rassam Arabzadeh, a modern car carpet weaver, carpet artist. It talks about the reconnecting with Jahan, a baskenabashim or Jahan khahad bud. In, as you know, many actually um, uh, poets, uh, historically uh, philosophers have been also Sufis, have been carpet weavers. So carpet weaving is a site of reflection and philosophizing. Also, it is a it is a site of, it's a virtual space, right? It's a virtual space. And, and in uh, prayer carpets, you see that the prayer carpet creates this space where you can think of a paradise, where you can think of a garden. So it's a virtual space, basically, that on, on, on that many people uh, perform prayer. And actually, I've written a piece which is online, and I added the um, reference here at the uh, um, at, at Yale University and you can consult that if you want to know more about that. So also carpets have been traditionally have been also uh, Freud had a carpet on his and uh, psychoanalytic uh, couch as uh, uh, as it has been mentioned, and uh, kind of this, the 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 in a in a sense, as Mar uh, Marina Warner argues, the relation between couch confession, erotic daydreaming, and a storytelling reverberates wonderfully in the figure of the most famous day bed in modern culture and a prime site of modern fantasy, Freud analytical couch, which it covered with a, an oriental, actually he covered it with a Persian carpet. So, and also you can see that Louis Bourgeois refers to carpets as, to carpet weaving as a form of, uh, as a form of uh, enchaîné or or a metaphor for weaving or creating a story out of an accumulation of fragments. And also many carpets, actually, many people remember stories when they lie down on a carpet or looking at a carpet can take you to a kind of virtual world, world of stories and ideas. So also uh, the most recent, more not, not too recent, but in the last 15 years, War carpets reflect the dystopic spaces of a car, our current world, where the landscape is occupied and destroyed 
by all kinds of weaponry. They're part of the militarization of space, but also the military imagination of the world. These are carpets that are being uh, produced uh, in Afghanistan. They depict the de deterritorialized hyperreality linking the war zone of Afghanistan to the collector homes or museum spaces of New York and Los Angeles. Indeed, if for the collector houses and museums in the United States or elsewhere, the war carpets are part of an old fashioned virtual reality entertainment world, in Afghanistan, the reminders of war occupation conflict from multiple occupations since 1980s by the Soviet Union or Russia and the United States, which have left devastating marks on people and landscape. In this context, the bodies on the ground are diminished as the images circulate, what gets to circulation, both as commodities and as images are carpets depicting technologies of war and aestheticized landscape, bringing modern realism and naturalism together with militarism and consumerism to make an aesthetic claim. Our everyday aesthetic lives is filled with the culture of militarism. So now, now let me go to the question of art. And actually, let me elaborate for a few minutes on the disconnect between art history and carpet weaving as an art. Since colonial modernity, again, arts, crafts, commodities have been separated from each other. So carpets have become the in-between objects of art, crafts, and commodity. You don't know what to do with them. They're in between spaces. Also, modern categorization of what is higher in the hierarchy of skills has marginalized weaving, textile, and carpet arts as decorative art or lower than other kinds of material art in the hierarchy of arts. Since the rise of capitalist commodity culture, many lives affirming feminized and feminine activities that cross the boundaries of art, craft, and commodity have lost their creative artistic components and managed to be mass produced as commodities. At the same time, these objects and commodities continue to carry their magic and their transformational power or mnemonic qualities under the sign of exoticism and orientalism. So the carpet as art resonate actually with a radical Italian art movement from the late 1960 to 1970, within which the artists used a wide range of materials, including soil, rags, throwaways, materials, cheap materials, to challenge and disrupt the values of the commercialized contemporary art gallery system. So following the mantra of art is life, the art, of, art povera artists eradicated the barriers between nature and art, craftsmanship and artists. The result was a new visual language, more poetry than prose, reframed art as living, tangible experience, living and tangible experience that is ever changing and alive to the senses. Arto Povera artists believe that art should be less about the object itself than the process of creating the ideas behind it. So now I'm working on a project which is actually looking at carpet inspired art and artists trying to break through this process by saying that weaving is life affirming and crucial for the collective life of the planet and the earth's inhabitants and more interested i'm more interested in how how artists break through the disciplinary order the disciplinary order of commodity culture and turn carpets into life affirming objects that go beyond representational practices so I'm specifically interested in how carpet artists develop an ecological vision and create a space to recognize weaving as reimagining of the 
futurity of labor as genuinely accessible, collaborative, and autonomous, an alternative to commodified wage labor, while this has been slipping away on their commodification. In other words, I ask in which ways is the carpet art complicating things or challenging the effects of repetitious cliche consumer-based design and release possibilities of a life or making us think of a world that is not here, but a world to come. So this is actually part of this new project. I have uh, written a short piece for the website of the Young Museum that is live now, and you can go and get a sense of this project. Uh, some part of this project is in there. And this is a, a carpet artist, Alexandra Kiarnoglu, who is an um, Argentinian, uh, Greek Argentinian carpet artist that is very invested in environmental issues. And she's here is she's made a carpet of a river that doesn't exist, that actually trying to raise consciousness about are in the environmental disasters, the loss of rivers, uh, and, and what we are experiencing at this particular time. So uh, now let me um, get to the last part of my talk and talk about the labor issues and the women's creative work. So as you know, uh, carpet industry was became the, the work of the carpet industry became transnationalized in 19th century. In 19th century, with the invention of the, uh, of the carpet, uh, um, of the loom uh, or the power looms that was, uh, was enabling um, uh, a fast production of carpets, uh, the, um, um, the, there are stories about in Britain that, uh, for example, a story I talk about in my book, that uh, that the British um, um, thought that they can they can actually they can now produce Persian carpets and actually they even produced a version of the hunting carpet, which is a, a very famous carpet. However, um, it was it became so difficult, and with with the carpet industry going through lots of strikes in England, we immediately started to shift the discourse to say that you know Oriental women are more patient to do that kind of work. So in that case, the most exploitative or the most time consuming, the most difficult parts of the labor was transferred to the periphery and we kind of we actually women continued uh, or men who worked within the context of informal economy continued to be involved in the carpet weaving so and while actually the uh, uh, the, the import export of uh, raw materials or chemical dyes and so on started to uh, come from Britain. So in that sense, it's this rural and tribal uh, women continue to perform, to produce carpets in various parts of Iran. So, and what we see here coming constantly in from early 20th century until present is this image of the Persian carpet weavers that I consider this image as a spectacle of labor rather than having to do anything with labor. So in this kind of imagery, rural and tribal women carpet weavers are depicted as ultimate victim of inhuman patriarchal relations. They're described as rural, tribal, unskilled labor, backward, primitive, with a natural patience to be to weave throughout the day. These forms of representation have mobilized the carpet industry. And at the same time, there has been a humanitarian discourse around women and children carpet weavers since the 19th century, rallying a rescue mission in the West to save these women. However, since the early 20th century, the carpet industry 
was transformed to become increasingly toxic. And nobody actually talks about the toxicity of the carpet industry and the impact of the impact of chemical dyes on the labor involved in the carpet industry. However, we are constantly showing this image of women at the carpet loom suffering. So in that case, women as victims or the tale of victimhood, there are lots of stories about carpet weavers, the stories of pain, and this image is the only place where we can see the labor or the carpet weaver in various articles or books. Indeed, such images mobilize guilt while concealing women's labor. Of course, guilt is part of the capitalist mode of production. Without guilt, capitalism cannot regulate itself. Also, regulation based on guilt is necessary for the perpetuation of the super exploitation of labor. As argued by Campbell, consumer demand could be linked with the emergence of a new religious ethic of benevolence, one in which virtue was associated with charitable feeling of pity and sympathy. So and I would say that actually most of the uh, images of, of the labor or the carpet weavers are actually uh, are from the back and actually depicting them as, as a stock at the loom. So however, women's work exceeds its extraction beyond exploited labor. The knowledge or savoir-faire as crucial to the work of carpet weaving is a cultural capital that is considered as an extension of women's bodies. Women consider it as a skill they should teach their daughters. While well, women carpet weaver that I talked to, they felt like carpet weaving was a skill that would enable their daughters to actually, first of all, connect with the community. Secondly, to become independent, to actually create revenue for themselves. And also when they move from one place to another place, they immediately have a community to connect with. This actually carpet weaving is a form of networking, right? So in that sense, carpet weaving also involves other forms of labor. It's not just the, the carpet that is exchanged in the market, but there is an access to the work that remains crucial for the continuity of the family. For example, women who work together, actually they do more than carpet weaving. There are children to take care of, there are older people to take care of, they're, um, they're cooking and uh, taking care of, uh, you know, um, the sick person and so on. So it's just, there is a lot of excess of, of carpet weaving that is wrong. And we never realized that those, those works of collaboration, collaboration and cooperation actually would require many other kinds of work. So Chinese feminist He and Zhen refers to weaving as life affirming and crucial for the collective life of the planet and the Earth's inhabitants. He and Jin devised two different, and He and Jin actually is a Chinese feminist who lived in late 19th century, early 20th century. She devised two different forms of labor. Labor as purely economic category in analytical distinction or separation from the economic, um, from the remainder of human life and work as an enslaved and commodified form. She argues that women embodied labor is crucial for the futurity of human labor or reimagining the labor as autonomous and genuinely free. Unfortunately, exploited women's work in the informal economy leaves little space for creativity since labor is discipline and surveillance made permanent. So, some tribal rocks are still they are still um, um, open to some uh, stories like Gabbe, which is a tribal carpet, is more more of a carpet that uh, reflect the stories of the village. So indeed, 
textile may be a substitute for written text and women alone could record and read the major events of their lives as noted by Katrin Kruger. So it's hard for women to exercise artistic autonomy in a patriarchal culture as well as true mass production where the meaning of work and creative mode of expression is relatively lost. The work of weaving is collective and collaborative and connected to the network of weavers, dyers, and many others, but also work that could be done in isolation. Weaving is in the realm of possibilities, crafting one's life or creating a world. So it's time, in my view, to separate between arts, crafts, and commodities from the back-breaking labor behind them. We need new definitions of art and work to understand the collective, collaborative, complex, life-affirming work of sustaining the memories, caring for the community, and women's knowledge and techniques of the past and the present. So there are many stories that are enfolded unfolded in um, in uh, Gabes, but there are stories that you could read in the back of the carpet. And I'm citing one of the carpet weavers I talked to. She says, she said, things happen when we start weaving a carpet. Women get sick, people die, they get into trouble in their relationships, they move to another location. All these events have an impact on the carpet. It's hard for the consumers of the carpet to identify this. But when I look at the knots in the back of the carpet, I remember all the events that took place during the weaving. And actually, this kind of the back of the carpet and the imperfect knotting uh, adds to the value of the carpet. But she, she also said that the imperfection, the rupture, the sadness are reflected in each knot. I can look at a carpet and tell you many stories and show you where it is reflected in the carpet. So let me conclude. I think I have a few minutes left by saying that the carpet is one of the oldest things that have endured the separation of the body from the work, the process from the product, the textile from the text, and the semiotic from the symbolic. Predominantly performed by women, weaving is one of the oldest forms of creative labor to visualize and textualize events that have taken place in time and space. So um, in mass producing economies, women weavers become objects or bodies exposed to the permanent surveillance of the capital, cast off, silenced, dismissed. Hence women's authorship has been tamed, disguised and reoriented toward the modern desire for the carpet as a commodity. Retrieving the object in the carpet by recognizing the meaning of creative labor as itself a relationship to current imperial and national patriarchal modes of signification may be a way to reassemble what is gradually lost at the juncture of commodity, capital, and representation of practices. Thank you so much for your patience. And I am now going to answer some of your questions. Okay, I think um, uh, there are no questions. I hope it's not, uh, 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 given that there are no questions, uh, we need to wrap up and uh, conclude uh, this talk. Thank you all for being here and for listening to this talk. And if you have any questions, please text me, email me, and I would be more than happy to answer your questions. And also the new, uh, my new project, a short piece of that is online and you're more than welcome to read it as well. Thank you so much.